What's up everybody? My name is Piero. Welcome to Car That Ate My Brain 2. If you haven't seen Car That Ate My Brain 1, go over to Amazon Prime and check it out. It's the story of Von Franco and his clone of the Kooky Car. So in this episode, I'm going to give you guys a quick history lesson. I ended up running into my buddies from customrama.com and they were able to give me Eric Johnson's phone number. That's Bob Johnson's stepson. We had him come out to Galpin and check out his stepdad's car and talk a little bit about it. Check it out. My name is Eric Johnston, and I've been associated with this automobile since I was seven years old. Well, the story started in 1954 when my stepfather and his cousin, Richard Johnston, um, decided that they were going to build a car. And this car was going to be the, a Model T bucket. I'm not really sure why Bob chose to do the T bucket instead of, say, a 32 Ford or a, or a Phaeton or any of the other cars at the time. But that was what he decided on. The original story went that he and his cousin went out to the, to the desert and picked up the original body, which may have or may not have happened. But the body that was on it and is on it, it was out of a wrecking yard. But of course, the myth was building at that time. The car was built from 1954 to about 1956 or 7, and it was not completed until 58. And that was after we had moved from Bellflower out to Anaheim. That was the start of the whole, you know, progression. He showed it on a local level just sort of exploded from there. I, I really wasn't too aware of how it got done, okay? But all of a sudden, he was in national shows. We went to that show and it was the only car show that they ever had at that time. We were invited to the car show and I forget who sponsored it, but it was strictly a Disney deal. And it was outside of the park in the parking lot. He won the Grand National Trophy away from everybody. And uh, he was real proud of that. I was at the show at the Hollywood Bowl. George Barris had taken pictures of the car that day. And the show got over in it, so I was gonna ride home in the, in the Roadster. And as we got on the freeway, it's about nine o'clock at night. And he punched up from it when we came off Highland, when we uh, crested the top and got on the freeway. I looked out the side of the car, and the car's blowing flame out both sides, blue flame about that long. Prettiest thing you ever saw. With Tweety Pie hitting the shows and getting a lot of attention, it was a natural progression for the magazines to scoop it up. Tweety Pie's first magazine cover was Rotting and Restyling, which came out in December 1959. The two-page spread showed off some nice details, like the interior and the freshly installed small block Chevy, which was a bit odd because it had the flathead on the cover. That same year, the car was on the cover of Griffith Borgson's On Hot Rods book. The car was featured on the cover but didn't have anything to do with it inside the magazine simply just a car on the cover. Tweety Pie hit the big time in June of 1960 when he landed on the cover of the popular Car Craft magazine. The feature showed a proud Bob Johnson, early flathead version of the Tweety Pie, and photos by Ed Roth. This was shot down the street from our house, and they took this car down, and there were more pictures than this. There were a bunch of models that were in it, too. Um, the original photo actually was a lot clearer uh, for the windows. You'll see a scrawny looking little kid about four feet tall with no hair. Yeah, that's me. Uh, the car speaks for itself. And I, I really have to say that the car probably is the, is the reason it went big. The 
evolution of Bob Johnson's Tweety Pie. This is the very first version of Bob Johnson's dream car. The Junkyard 1923 Model T Roadster body had been widened 3 inches in the center of the cowl in order to fit over the 1932 Ford frame rails. The 1932 Ford chassis has been heavily modified. The frame was narrowed a foot and a half and has an overall length of 93 inches, giving it that short 82 inch wheelbase. Bob's engine of choice at the time was a 1948 board and stroke flathead with Navarro heads and dual Strombergs. Bob wanted the car to stand out so he chose the brightest yellow he could find to paint the motor. To get it in gear it's got a 1939 Ford transmission. It's running a 1936 Ford front end with juice brakes. It also has a pair of Fordson tractor headlights and custom made headlight stands. It's running a 34 commercial truck grill that's been heavily modified by Dick. It has 15 inch wheels all the way around and sports high dome beanie caps and beauty rings. The metalwork and paint was done by Bob's cousin, Dick Johnston. And when it came time to choose a color, Bob chose Royal Titan Purple based on the color of the actual oil. They used a vacuum cleaner to paint the car in Bob's garage in Anaheim, California. The interior was done by Lee Garofolo of Lee's Golden Needle in Garden Grove, California. And it is a white Naga hide with tuck and roll and purple piping. The steering wheel is a 1956 Thunderbird and it's attached to an oddball Ross steering box. In 1958, Bob's good friend Ed Roth striped the car. And while at the Renegades car show, Ed Roth ended up painting those famed letters on that gas tank that spelled out Tweety Pie, which was probably a cool sight to see. On the rear you could see the heavily modified and narrowed 32 rear cross member. It's running 1950s Yankee 975 Beehive brake lights. And turning the wheels is a 1939 Ford Banjo rear end. The lake headers up front ran underneath the car and out the back through the frame rails. By the time they shot this photo, Bob had already reversed the rear wheels and got a new set of US Royal tires. The aluminum firewall is attached in the stock position and has a fuel block mounted to it. The steering box is mounted to a tower that bolts onto the top of the frame rail and sits outside of the firewall. This works well with the flathead, but will have to change with the new upgrade. I asked him, I says, why did you put the small block in the car? You know, I mean, the car looked great the way it was. And um, he said, I got to keep the car fresh for the shows or they won't ask me to come to the shows anymore. You know, and the competition will win. Bob added a 1955 265 small block Chevy with a four barrel carburetor, Corvette valve covers, clear plug wires, and custom made lake headers with baffles in it to keep the car nice and quiet. With the new motor upgrade, some changes needed to be done with the steering box in order for it to all work. The firewall was pushed forward a couple inches and the steering box now mounts behind it. The somewhat vertical tower is now leaning backwards with an aluminum wedge underneath it and by the look of it they had to cut out the dash and add an aluminum piece for more support on the column. They ended up having to cut the side of the cowl and repainting it. As you can see here there is no pinstriping on this side. Bob's third and final version of Tweety Pie, he wanted the car to have more of a performance vibe. So he went ahead and added a few more things. The first performance upgrade was a must. An Offenhauser intake, six Stromberg 97s, and an Edelbrock fuel log. And a white radiator hose, of course. A close up of the steering box, you can see the actual aluminum wedge that they used, and the revised Ed Roth pinstriping. So when it came time to decide what version I wanted to clone, I had many options but I really like Bob's third version the best. Some of the main reasons why I like this version is that small blocks are cheaper than flatheads, aluminum is cheaper than chrome, a lot of stuff's painted, a lot of stuff's polished, and it's the last version that Bob did before he sold it to Roth. We're sitting around one night and we're at the house out in Bellflower and we're watching these cartoons. My stepfather says, well, what do you think we ought to name the car? And I says, well, why don't you name it after that currently popular song, uh, The Purple People Eater? Okay, well, that crashed and burned before it ever got off the ground. Well, I got another idea. Oh, good. Tweety Pie. And my mother and my stepfather went, hey, that's got possibilities. Okay, you know. And when the decision was made, the name was changed slightly to Tweed D pie with a D instead of a T because my stepfather didn't want Jack Warner coming out to the house and jumping on him about copyrights. In 1958, 
Jack Warner started production on 77 Sunset Strip, and there was talks about having Tweety as the main character, Cookies, on screen ride. Jack Warner called my dad on the phone, said that he had the contract for the car to be used in 77 Sunset Strip. I was completely appalled when my stepfather went, no, I don't want to do that. I've decided not to. They wanted his name on the bottom line, and he told them no. And reason why? Didn't The lamest reason I ever heard of. He didn't want anybody else driving the car. Norm Grabowski's car was chosen instead, which had been waiting in the wings, apparently. It was up between the two of them. The car was getting used less and less, and sat in the garage under Visqueen for several months. Bob's career was taking off, and he was getting busier and busier, and it was just time to let the car go. What were your feelings about him selling the car? I was horrified. I'm still horrified about it because of what happened to the car, okay? I saw this car developing into something, and I thought, hey, that's going to bring all of us along with it. And, of course, it got sold, and that never happened. He sold it to Ed Roth for $1,150. I was standing there when he handed him the check, and the check was on a Ravel check. Ed Roth comes out with a buddy of his. They were eating chicken, fried chicken in the car. He gets out of the car, he goes like this wipes his hands off, walks over, hands my stepfather a check. My stepfather looks at it, goes, okay, fine, puts it in his pocket. The keys are in the roadster. And uh, he walked over, got in it, backed out of the driveway and drove away. And that was the car that you see virtually in that magazine. So here we are in uh, Anaheim, California. This is the neighborhood where Tweety Pie was built, and actually this house right behind me, this greenhouse, uh, the car was done here, and this is where Ed Roth um, ended up buying the car off of Bob Johnson um, on that sad day. Ed Roth had a contract with Ravel to produce a car every year or so, and that he was between cars when the contract came due. So what did Roth do? He bought a car that was already finished and had a little bit of popularity. Ed quickly switched gears from the Beatnik Bandit and focused on upgrading the Tweety Pie so he can deliver it to Ravel and fulfill his contract. The first and most obvious upgrade Ed did was the 15-inch chrome reverse wheels with beanie caps. Then he paid a visit to the chrome shop. He had the valve covers, the 97s, the scoops, and the firewall all chromed. One of the last things that Bob built for the car before he sold it was this cool Nerf bar. It was thought to be that Roth had built this Nerf bar, but actually it was Bob who did, right before he sold the car. He also turned the scoops around and tweaked the exhaust tip so it would face up more. Word spread around that Roth got a new hot rod, and in March 1962, Rod and Custom came looking for him. They put him on the cover and did a full feature. Tweety Pie gets that famous Roth treatment. The photo shoot took place at Linwood City Park, and the same photos were used repeatedly over and over again like on the cover of Custom Hot Rods 1962 Annual, where the same photo shoot was used from the other magazine. Ross sold glossy 8x10 photos of all his cars, and he had this one made of Tweety Pie as well. After the feature came out, Rod and Custom decided to put out a series of trading cards, using Hot Rods and Customs from previous shoots. After Roth bought it, mm -hmm. they he took it from our house to Ravel's shop where they did the measurements for the model kit. Okay. The model kit, I guess, came out about six months later. The engineers at Revell loved what Roth was doing with the car so far, but felt that it didn't have enough flash. Ed went on and started adding a little bit more to it. So a few weeks later, Ed brought the car back to Revell to show off some of the new upgrades. He started off by making a new headlight bar and adding quad headlights. He chromed the windshield frame and added aftermarket knockoff caps. Ed went ahead and had the interior completely redone. He did it in a lavender naga hide with light blue mink carpet and matching brake and clutch cover. It also had a white Krager steering wheel added to it 
as well as an old tap beer tap handle for the shifter. The engineers at Ravel couldn't be happier with what Roth had done to the car so far. It was exactly what they were looking for and he was able to fulfill his contract. The car will be sized and measured and go into full production as a model kit. And this is it. This was the version that all the kids in the world would go crazy after. He thought Ed Roth's work was what it was. It was art. And, and it was, to him, it was kitsch art. Outlaw art, whatever you want to call it. But it was still art. There was nothing practical about it. He sort of guffawed about it. But then, there, like I said, it, that was a subject that wasn't brought up around the dinner table very much. In 1963, Ravel released the Tweety Pie model kit, and no details were spared. It was an instant hit, just like all the other Roth model kits were. To date, the Tweety Pie model kit has sold over 11 million units to kids, teenagers, and adults all around the world. Oh, he thought the model kits were just dynamite. Three and a half, three and a half million models in the first year. With the popularity of the Tweety Pie model kit, Ravel decided to cash in on the Roth Rat Fink style. They released the Tweety Pie with Boss Fink kit, which utilized the original Tweety Pie model kit, but adding cartoonish style wheels and tires, a long shift knob, and a bust of Ed Roth holding a vulture. Oh yeah, there was a couple of model kits. He didn't build them. I built a couple of them. I still have a model kit. After Roth took it over to Ravel, Roth got um, a contract to put the car in a Gidget episode. Hi, mind if I start with you? Now maybe I do mind. You two guys, the rear end tailpipes and muffler. Center wiring. Morris down distributor. Lawrence, uh, Lawrence, pull the battery. Pull the battery? Battery. See, that's somewhere in the front. Here, you need this. <laughs> come on, come on, under here. With Tweety Pie's newfound popularity, Roth toured the car around the United States while the Beatnik Bandit was being built. Once the Beatnik Bandit was done, Roth had to put all his focus towards that and didn't have the space or the time for Tweety Pie, so up for sale it went. This is one of the last shots of Tweety Pie while Ed Roth owned it. You can see that he changed the tires and added skinny white walls to it. In 1964, Ed Roth sold the car to Chris Lavoy we ended up owning it until 2006, when the car changed hands again. What do you think your dad would think about um, us building this clone of his car? I think my father would, stepfather would have been overjoyed with it. I mean, I think what happened to the car would have overjoyed him. I don't, I don't know how to say it. It, it's literally like doing the Sistine Chapel and thinking that you painted the side of somebody's house. Right. Okay, <laughs> you know, I, and I know that's a bit pretentious and sure. all, but you know, kind of work with me on that one. So I hope you guys enjoyed the history of the car. Now it's time to focus on the build. We've been documenting this car for over two and a half years and we got a lot done to it. But now we're gonna go back in time and show you how it all began. 